Good morning. This is uh, Sunday School. Acts chapter uh, 15. I think it's just part number 21. We're almost done here with Acts chapter 15. So we've been looking at, uh, at, at these four st- statements that James has made about uh, write, writing into them about uh, the pollutions, the abstaining from pollutions of idols, the uh, fornication, things strangled, and then from blood. And we discussed it. So the reason why that James is writing this is that there is a mixed group of people of Jew and Gentile, and that, that to, the, to the Gentile who have been deeply involved in pagan worship, how deeply involved? Well, look with me over at Acts and look at verse number 17, Acts chapter 17, verse 16. This is just how deeply involved the Gentile nations were in idolatry. It says in verse number 16, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to what? Wholly given to idolatry, right? So what's really interesting is in our day and age, to, to become a uh, an atheist is the, is the new normal, right? Everybody wants to be an atheist. Oh, atheist. Oh, it's so dumb of you. It's such, it's such weak-minded. It's such a crutch for you to believe in a god. Well, back then, you everybody believed in a god, right? They, they believed that there was a higher supreme being. There was no possibility or potentiality that this happened by chance or this was just an occurrence, uh, but that it was, in fact, miraculous and that they had some type of divine being, whatever that might be. Sometimes they made it with their hands, but they thought they were going to give adoration to something higher than them, right? That's innate in you. That's built inside of you. And when you try to remove yourself from that, you, you don't become a free thinker, right? You become, you become really bound to this, this new normal, as I call it. That's what all of our the younger kids of, this, of our day and age, they're becoming more and more ingrained in that. They want to get away from believing in a god or gods or higher powers or, or, or intelligent design. Because one of the major reasons why they do that is it rids them of any type of morality, right? Because when you, can, when you get to make your own choice, that postmodern thought, as the postmodern thought is, everything is subjective, everything is relativistic, it's all what you feel and what you desire, and don't tell me what to do, and don't tell me that this is wrong or this is bad, let me make up my mind for myself, let my conscience be my guide. Oh, wow, okay, well that's not going to really help you out too much, because you're going to run into a big issue with the law. Right? Because unfortunately the law tells you that you have to do these things. We're not talking about the law of Moses. We're talking about you know, the laws of the state of Florida or the, or the federal government. You're still going to be mandated to do specific things, so you can't be. Well, I don't like that, right? So what are they trying to do nowadays? They're trying to do everything they can to be as relativistic as possible. That is, to be as politically correct, and then to ultimately do what? To reduce morality, right? To, to put, there is no morality anymore. That's something that's very subjective, very, very subjective. Um, I, I saw that little picture recently that was posted on Facebook, you know, that the Cecil the Lion that was killed, right? You saw that. Who really cares? It's a lion. Who, I mean, really. I mean, honestly, it's, it's a lion. Um, do you know how many kids in Africa die of starvation every day? I mean, really? You, got, you guys are freaking out about a lion? Oh, oh, okay, and then you won't help little kids in Africa that are getting bit? 20,000 mosquito bites. That's what they get every year. 20,000 mosquito bites every year. I mean, I get like five sometimes when I'm out fishing, maybe even like 10, and I'm dying. I'm like, oh my goodness, next day my arms all like got bites, my neck's all bit up. 20,000, I mean, just putting that in perspective for you, it's, it's the way they can, they can spin things. And what I thought was really interesting is I had a little picture of a womb that had like a little see-through with a baby in it, and then it had like a little stick with a lion head that had Cecil's face on it, and it said, save me, please. And I was like, wow, that's pretty good. It's a comic, but again, it makes you think. People are more willing to stand up for a lion uh, than they are to stand up for a child in a womb. And they say, well, what are they trying to do? Don't push anything on me. Postmodern thought, relativism, subjectivism. What I think's right, that's, that's for me. I, that's for me to decide. Don't push your beliefs upon me, right? I need to make choices. Well, yeah, you made a choice. Your choice was to participate in an action that creates children, which you knew the, the consequences of such, and then you go from there. Oh, but what about rape, and what about incest? What about rape, what about incest? Very easy to, to, to say, two wrongs don't make a right, right? You don't kill something because something wrong happened, right? Follow me how that works? You don't, you don't just like, oh, I'm gonna kill the baby because of rape, that, that's, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you kill something? That, why would you harm the, the, the unborn? That, that doesn't make any sense. Well, I don't wanna have to live with that and all those things. Well, a lot of people don't have to live with a lot of different things, but again, you know, the, 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 the pro-choice movement is not about pro-choice, it's about not being responsible for your choices. So, uh, 
whatever. We can digress on that and go back to Acts chapter 15 or 6, 16 or 17, just where he says there, the whole city was wholly given to idolatry. So clearly, idolatry was a pretty big pagan ritual that they were doing. And I just said that, look, everybody back then believed that there was some form of a god. It wasn't like, oh, no, uh, no gods. Uh, that, that was, nobody would say that. You wouldn't walk up to somebody in the street and say, I don't believe there's any God whatsoever. This whole thing was just a, it exploded and it all came to be. People look at you and go, well, that's crazy. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard, right? So in Acts chapter 15, what we're finding is that there's a group of people who, who at one point believed in other deities. They weren't really deities. They were just man-made graven images. They were spirit things that they created, whatever demonic things that they decided to do things that would exalt themselves above the Most High, only God, Jehovah. And what you're finding is that, okay, now these guys are learning that the Gentiles are going, okay, we see that there's, there's, there's Jehovah God who we believe in Jesus Christ, and, and, and we, we believe that he's now the one true, only God, and, and we believe the gospel, and that's great and all. And what's the problem? Well, they've had all these years of growing up with pagan rituals and, and feast days and all these other things that they need to be taught and they need to be instructed. When you give somebody the gospel, they don't just magically get all their doctrine. It requires some time and training and teaching to bring the person up to speed. That is to edify that particular person. Now, the Jews, on their hand, they've been somewhat underneath the law. They've, they've known some things about who, who Moses is and those type of, of uh, Old Testament uh, learnings, teachings, proverbs. And so they're, they're a little bit more up to speed on what's happening. So what takes place now in a group of Jew and Gentile that are both together, what's happening? Well, Gentiles are 100% up to speed as of what they can and can't do or what they should and shouldn't do or what's edifying and what's not edifying. And they're doing things that are offending or belittling and then making a stumbling stone to the Jews that are there. And those Jews, when they hear it, they're, they're going, they're, they're doing what? I can't believe that. Stop that. And so and to, the, to, to the actual Gentiles, they don't really know any better. They're just kind of like, well, what do you mean? What's the problem here, right? It's not offending their conscience because they've never been instructed that, that the life is in the blood, right? They, they've never been instructed that to eat something offered to an idol is a, is a big deal, especially after they learn about it. They go, who cares? It's just a dumb idol. Doesn't even have, there is no God but one, right? We understand that. We know that. And to, and to, and to eat something and say that we can't eat it because it's offered to an idol, all that does is make the idol more powerful, give it power that it doesn't really even have. And so what, what, what James is trying to do with the help of Paul and the other guys is to, is to keep the peace among these groups. Remember when the Jews and the Gentiles started to, to become a more unified body here, post the, the kingdom, post Paul's kind of, uh, post the gospel of the kingdom, I should say, into Paul's ministry, where do you think the Gentiles had their church services, right? A lot of times they go right into the synagogues like, well, we already got this building right here. Might as well just go ahead and use it for the church, right? Anybody have a problem with that? No. And so they would go in there and they would start to use these synagogues. And, of course, the ritualistic things of what the Jews would do, the Gentiles didn't do any of that type of thing, right? And so the Gentiles and the Jews are all of a sudden now living in a common accord, and it's necessary. I don't mean living as in their they're not living like in Solomon's porch in Acts chapter 2, 3, and 4. They're, they're operating together as a, as a unified body, and they want to keep that peace through the endeavoring of love with what in mind at all points and times? The edification of one another, right? It's things that are not going to set a stumbling stone. So when he says in verse number 20 of Acts chapter 15, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. These things are given to them in particularity because, it says in verse 21, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So they're saying, guys, we need to give them something to read in the synagogues every Sabbath day that is not the law of Moses because that's not going to benefit them. They're not going to go through. So we always keep asking, why these four things? Well, we've, we've told you why these four things. These are the four primary things that the Gentiles were doing that would deeply offend and cause a huge division among the church, right? So let's keep the peace. Let's do things that aren't going to set a stumbling stone to the, the brothers that are there, right? So in verse number 22, then it pleased the apostles. Everybody agreed that because they've been reading Moses of old time in the city and they've been reading him in the synagogues, then sure, it, it, it's necessary that, that we write to them. But not only that, it says that we please the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Why does that have to happen? Well, well who came supposedly from James in the beginning? 
these legalizers, these guys who are saying, you got to get circumcised, you got to keep the law of Moses. And James makes it known, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Remember, go back up to uh, verse number 24. For as much as we have heard that certain which are out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised, and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. So, of course, he's going to say, well, what's the best validation? Sir, Paul and Barnabas can come down there and say, we, we heard from James that they didn't send anybody like that. Or they could send their other fellow brethren down and say, look, like, that's not what we're doing. Right? We, we agree that you don't have to do that. You as being the Gentiles. Now, the question becomes, and the one that we've been kind of going over these last couple weeks is, are the Jews bound to this as well? See, in Paul's eyes, Paul puts no distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. Right? Not at all. Not at all. In Christ, there is neither Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female. doesn't even matter, right? James, does he see it that way? Clearly not. In Acts chapter 15, he's saying, as touching the Gentiles and all those things, they don't have to observe these things. He never says it in relation to the Jews. Actually, he says the opposite in Acts chapter 21. In Acts chapter 21, he makes it very known that the Jews, yes, they do. They do need to keep these things. Paul, we've heard that, that you're teaching all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to do what? to forsake Moses and to not circumcise their kids. What is it? The multitude, all the Jews are going to come together, and what are we going to do about that? And that's when Paul goes forward and does the things that he does out of a way of really, look, he doesn't have to do any of that stuff. I consider some of that to be probably sinful in that he was told not to do that in terms of going there, that, there, that he was not going to be received of the Jews. But he does that as many say, well, I, I, I became all things to all men, right? That by all means, I might save some of them. So he, he's attempting because he has a deep desire, Romans 9. You know, you know my heart's dying prayer to God for Israel, Romans 10, Romans chapter 9. He's got a continual sorrow in his heart for his brethren after the flesh, the Israelites. He says he wishes that he could be a curse from God, right? Anything he could do, he's even being disobedient to the command of Christ to try to go and save these individuals. So when, after they write these guys letters, and they say, you know, verse number 23, and they wrote them letters, by them after the manner, the apostles and elders and brethren, saying greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles. Notice that what it says again. See, I'm not trying to make the distinction because it's not there. I'm making the distinction because it keeps showing up. Every time I talk about it, this letter was not sent to the Jews. See how it works? He says, and they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren, saying greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles. The brethren which are of the Gentiles, the brethren which are Gentiles, right? Go with me to Acts 21 just for a second. See, I, I'm not saying that Paul's teaching anything different. I'm saying that James is going to continue on to his program in relation to law and what he believes it is. And then I believe that there is a slow falling of James and the others. I, I've, I've taught this pretty much the last couple of weeks, but I believe there's a slow decline of James and the others. And, 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 and not just decline in the sense that their, their ministry's you know, petering out or anything like that. No, what it really is, is that there's a corruption that's coming in because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, right? So if you keep a lot of people, you keep a lot of Pharisees and legalizers around, what's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to be like, oh, I'm affected by these Pharisees. I'm affected by these legalizers. I'm going to do Pharisee and legalizer things. And the, 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 the absolute truth, the pinnacle of this, the, the thing that I say, okay, it's, it's the body of it all, is when Paul is standing there and all the Jews say, off with his head, let's kill him. It's, it's not fit that this man should live. And where's James? Nowhere to be found. Wait, wait, what about all the apostles and other elders? Nowhere to be found. What about at least one or two Jews that were there that, that definitely, I mean, Barnabas told him that this is Brother Paul. He's a believer. Was anybody standing up for him? No. Not a single person says, hold on, guys, Jews, wait a second. You know who this guy is. They were frustrated at his message. They were frustrated at his ministry. And as a result, they wanted him dead. And he suffered all those things because of what he believed Jesus Christ had told him. He believes what, what the revelations are, and he was faithful to preach that. He's, he was a minister in bonds because of that. He was arrested for preaching the gospel. And what I like to, to, to say is that's a fulfillment of the prophecy of Acts chapter number 9, in which Jesus says, I'm going to show you how many things you're going to suffer for my name's sake. And he suffers those things, not as an evildoer, 
but as a doer of good, as, as, a, as a helper of the Jews, and they still take him wrong. So what I'm trying to show you in Acts chapter 21 is, again, look what he says. They wrote letters which to the brethren which are of the Gentiles, right? Which are of the Gentiles. He's not writing to the Jews. There's a slow decline of James and the others. In verse number 20, he says, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, this is Acts 21, 20, how many thousands, thousands of Jews there are, which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Now, believe what? Well, what do they believe? Well, go back with me again to Acts chapter 15 for a second. And read verse number 5. 15, 5, hold your place in Acts 21. But there rose up certain of the sect, this is Acts 15, 5, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Who is the them? It's the Gentiles. So in their mind, they're still thinking, hey, there's, this, there's this debate about Jew and Gentile. There's this debate about, hey, well, if you guys are Jews, follow me? If you Gentiles are Jews, then you better be acting like Jews. Better do Jew things. What does most of Christianity do today? They do Jew things. They do Jew stuff. They read Jew magazines, and they like the Jews, and they worship the Jews, don't they? I mean, isn't it true that, that, that modern-day evangelical Christianity is all about the Jews? There's a, there's a video that's been going around recently that, that shows... Um, uh, what's, what's the Steve Anderson video called, Scott, again? I'm not a huge fan of him. Uh, Marching to Zion, Marching to Zion. Now, I'm not going to endorse that video as being, you know, absolute truth or anything. There's some good information in it. There's a lot of wackadoodle information in it as well. But it, it's interesting where he interviews some of these major guys or he goes and, and, and shows you just how, like, the Phil Hagees and the other guys like that, that, how just absolutely in love with Israel these people are. And you go, well, hold on. If, if, there's, if you're so in love with these people, I mean... Who are the who are the Pharisaical Jews then, right? Who are the legalizers? Who are the the, the self righteous zealots? The concision? Who are those people then? Where do those guys live then? Where are they, right? So what you're seeing in Acts chapter number twenty one is 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 the the be the really the continuation of this from the time of Christ. Russ has been on this Matthew 3 thing recently where he, he keeps talking about John the Baptist and he keeps talking about how John the Baptist is there and he says, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Remember he said that a couple last couple weeks? Well, that's these same people, right? These are the same legalizers, these same guys who, who are all zealous of the law and they're supposedly believers, okay? You know what Paul calls them? He calls them false brethren unawares brought in. False brethren unawares brought in they say they're brothers oh we're brothers in christ absolutely we, we are brothers in christ but we want you to become a jew right and so that's what the church is trying to do today they're trying to become jews they're really they really are trying to become jews because they're following really the line of james they're following the, the thinking of james and these other guys right and you say well james doesn't say those things well james by by silence really makes admissions right if I say something, you remain silent in it, it's pretty much an admission. You have an opportunity to, to go, whoa, 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 wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. No, and then by his own mouth here, he says, there's, there's all these Jews which believe they are all zealous of the law. And notice in verse number 18, it doesn't just say that James said this privately with, with Paul. In 2118, all the Jews that were there, he says, and all the elders were present. So all the elders in what regard? Elders of what? Who are these elders? Well, these are the same dudes who've been living in the synagogue and working in the synagogue their whole life. And when they saw all the, all the believers, all the, all the Jewish converts to the kingdom gospel, the little flock and all them, inside of uh, Solomon's porch, they're going, well, yeah, we need to still worship in the synagogue. So I guess we're just going to have to you know, do what we got to do to get in there and do our stuff, right? They're going to double speak. They're going to be men pleasers. They're going to do whatever they need to do to just to, to continue doing their things. But then they're going to slowly ill affect the brethren. They're going to slowly seep in there and, and corrupt the truth of the gospel, right? And they're going to use their position as being God's chosen people, the Jews, to affect the Gentiles, right? Remember when they teach such things, but they don't even know what they're teaching? They say that they're a Jew. They, they, they boast in the law. And God says, look, you say all that stuff, you do all that stuff, but the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of what you're doing. 
Romans chapter number 2. So in Acts 21 and verse number 21, this verse is, this is, this verse is amazing to me. I, I mean, I cannot tell you that, that of all the verses in the scripture, this has got to be like top 10. I'm not kidding. Like, this is like a top 10. This is a top 10, like, verse right here. This in the next, like, seven verses, okay? He says, And are they informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs? What is it there for? Or in other words, is there any truth to that statement? Is that really what you're preaching? The multitude must needs come together. So the multitude is everybody except for the, it's, it's, it's the whole grouping of people that are there, the multitudes, the thousands of Jews there are which believe. The multitudes are going to come in and go, hey, Paul's here. Hey, what do we have to ask him about? Oh, that's right. All that stuff about, you know, negating the law. Hmm? Tell, tell us, Paul, tell us about how you negate the law. Tell us how, how the Jews or the Gentiles no longer need to get circumcised. Do you think there's a confusion in the mind of these Jews about what the Gentiles were? Do you think that they were just trying to convert them to be Jews as they did in the Old Testament? How did they convert the Gentile? What was one of the first things the Gentile had to do? They had to get circumcised. Okay? So they're going, well, you can't even be a part of this program unless you get circumcised, so you better go and get circumcised. And the Gentile who knew the scripture would say, oh, I already am circumcised. Who did it? Oh, it's of my heart. Oh, we don't have anything like that. We don't know what that is. We don't. That doesn't make any sense to us. That's that's foolishness, right? Going on in verse number twenty-two. What is it? Therefore, the multitudes must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Now, notice what James says. James says does not say this. James does not say, you know what, Paul, we get it. We understand that the, that, that the new gospel, the grace of God is out here and that, that God's working through the fall of Israel right now, you know? And that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And we're so thankful that the Gentiles are just, just rising up and, and getting so full. And, and, and you know what? We know that they're going to lead us to emulation and, and that they're going to bring us to envy. And, and, that, and that as a result of it, you know, uh, God's going to provoke us to jealousy. And we know we, it's okay. We're fine with that. You follow me? Does he say any of that stuff? Does he even understand any of that stuff? I'm quoting some stuff from Romans 9, 10, and 11, but, but no. He says, do therefore this. Now, I want you to pay real close attention to this. He says, do therefore this that we say to thee. Do. I have a command for you. Do it. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that that they may shave their heads. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are what? Are nothing. That what? That, that you're not preaching? That the Jews have to do what? See, what it is, is go, go to Galatians just for a second. This is, how, this is the problem. It's, it's, it's Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 14. And read verse number 2, verse 14. He says, but when I saw that they walk not uprightly, this is the Jews, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, he says that in kind of like a negative connotation, if thou, being a Jew, right? We know who you, 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 being a Jew, that is, you want to live like a Jew, you want to still retain your lineage of Jewishness. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? See how that works? Well, we, we, well, we know, because... Being a Jew, I can, I can say, well, I can rule over these Gentiles. I got a bunch of stuff, I got a bunch of clout, I got a bunch of position. of. But what are they doing? They're like, well, living like a Jew? I do remember that one verse that Christ said, Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Yeah, I remember that. Remember that? Well, yeah, it's because when you live you know, with a right understanding of the law, and you're freed from the law, and you're freed from sin, and you're freed from the fear of death and everything else, and the guilt and conscience, living like a Gentile when all things are lawful, but all things aren't expedient, huh, that sounds like a great way to live, right? Much, much easier to live under grace than it is to live under law. The grace, grace, I mean, you, do we understand just how awesome it is to live under grace than it is to live underneath the law of Moses? Whew, pretty, pretty good. Um, 
one of my favorite verses on that is where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. That's probably one of the best verses you can think of in your head. So when Satan goes, yeah, but you sure you're saved? You sin a lot. Yeah, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You know, I'm thankful for the cross of Christ every day, and so should we all. And we should never get into the mindset that, oh, I'm, I don't know if I'm good enough to be saved. I don't know if I, if, have I sinned too many times? It's like, that's your wrong mentality. That's what Satan would like to do. Satan would like to constantly make you go, nah, there's no way. This is too good to be true. And when you believe it's too good to be true, that, that, that's actually a good part. You should actually go, it is too good to be true. It is, that's, that's the power of the grace of God. It's so unbelievable in the minds, uh, in the world's mindset or the world's view. So going back here, they're living, you know, as do the Jews. Why compel us of the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? You know, he's, he's making a distinction there because they're making a distinction. Paul never makes the distinction, right? You never see him treating the Gentiles differently than the Jews and the Jews differently than the Gentiles. He treats them all the same, right? So in back to Acts chapter 21, I, I read that last part where he says, but that thou thyself, notice he says all these things, verse 21, 24, wherefore they were informed concerning thee that are they are nothing, that they're nothing. All these things, these rumor mills that have been happening about you and not having to keep the law of Moses and you teaching those Gentiles, that, that's all bunk nonsense. And you don't believe any of that stuff, right? I mean, I think this is a huge compromise for him. It was a huge compromise. And I do believe it's sin. I mean, I, I think you, you have to. If you go back and study how it's out, where, he, where he's real defiant to Agabus and he's real defiant to Luke and the other, he says, oh, I'm not ready just to be bound, but I'm ready to be killed. I'll die. Well, great. I mean, that shows kind of his stubbornness. He was a very stubborn person, but at the same point, he was he was the perfect person for the job. You know, uh, it still shows uh, you know the, the need for grace in his life. But going on, he says, as touching verse twenty five. Here's where James gets in terms of the Gentiles. He says, as touching the Gentiles. Notice where he's 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 on. James's main issue is is that the gen the Jews who are among the Gentiles he still wants those people those are my people those are my Jews you stop touching my Jews you 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 don't take those guys away from me those are our people right but what what is Paul thinking Paul thinks no those are all the heathen right if you remember if you read through Romans chapter fifteen he says that he doesn't want to he doesn't want to preach the gospel to get on top of any other man's foundation, right? He doesn't want to go and preach where Christ has been preached, that type of thing, because he might run into more of this stuff. He runs into the part where, okay, they're running the kingdom gospel program. They're running stuff where they think they're definitely going through the tribulation period. They think they're getting ready to walk into the kingdom. They're, they're prepping for the last days. And I, on the other hand, am going, well, I'm, I'm reaching out to all the Gentiles and we got the fullness of the Gentiles and we see Israel's fall. And, and you see how it's just like completely, it's like completely two separate issues going on. So when you, when you come down here to verse 25 where he says it's touching the Gentiles which believe, he's, he's saying, look, we, we get it. Let the Gentiles do whatever the Gentiles want to do, but don't make the Gentiles affect the Jews. Don't let those Gentiles do anything that messes with the Jewish people. Now, does Paul agree with that? No, he doesn't agree with that. He doesn't think there's any difference in that. But he does agree that he's going to try to you know, do things for, for the edifying of, of the body for love and, and to help the body and things like that. But when you read verse 25, is touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded, that's, for, that's Acts chapter 15, that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Let's see what happens if you go over me to the book of Revelation, chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2 and verse number 14. This is what he says, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse number 14. It says this, But I have few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed on idols, and to commit fornication. Going over to uh, verse number 20, it says, Notwithstanding, I have few things against thee, because thou hast suffered that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So I'm showing you that because these were, remember what I read in the beginning of Acts 17, that the whole city was given away, given to, holy, given to idolatry. Well, we can take that all the way back to the roots of, of Egypt and, 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 and you know them being the super world power way back when Israel kind of departed in the Exodus. But when, when uh, Israel left the Exodus in Egypt, remember what they did? Remember when they were all naked, hanging out? 
you need to be naked to worship idols? Is this something new? Well, they're they're doing you know the fornication thing. I mean, have you ever have you ever studied any of these weird guys? I mean, uh, I can't even. We you know when you need to remember something, you just don't remember any of the names. Like if you asked me, you know, if you said, oh, you know, write these down, I would be fine. But you know, if I have to remember them right now, I just can never remember them. But there's a bunch of these guys, and I actually had the names in my head. Don't remember them anyways. There's there's a bunch of these guys. If you look at the history of weird Christian offshoots of religions and the propaganda stuff and those things, what a lot of them do. A lot of them were based upon fornication. They would be like, oh yeah, you guys all need to get together here and fornicate. Well, why do we need to do that? That doesn't make any sense. How, what does that have to do with the Christianity thing? Well, they would do that as like, they use their power of position and leadership authority, but they would also do it just because it's been a historical thing. That's what they always have done. Go back and look at the Exodus in Egypt, and what do they all do? They all got naked, they danced around, they fornicated, they got drunk, and they ate the meat offered to the cow, right? I mean, that's what they did. So Paul's like, okay, we can't have any of that stuff. That's going to really be a huge problem. It's going to create a stumbling stone for everybody else. But not only that, that's not expedient. That's, that's not something that you should be participating in, okay? We're going we're gonna to get eventually into more of the, uh, the fornication thing in, in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, which are, which are pretty good. But you can just see that these, I'm just tying these things together, that, that the idol worship was not just like, you know, here's a little idol and we bow down to it or something like that, right? There was a whole thing in relation to, to, to the feasting of that idol, the way they would, they would take blood and put blood all around the idols, you know, all that kind of stuff. They'd, they, would, they would, you know, do fornication ceremonies and all those things. So you kind of are following me that that's all, how that all comes together. So, all right, where, where are we at? What are, where are we trying to get to, you know, today? Well, I think today we're just trying to, 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 to get to the end of this, which is, which is so hard to do, but... Go over to, to 24, Acts 15, 24, and let's try to get through some of this. And then I'm going to have so much more to talk about. We have a few more minutes left to go. But So Acts 15, 24, James says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words. Those are the people that Paul calls the false brethren, unawares brought in. Right? That's who he calls those guys. He goes, subverting your souls. Well, hey, at least he agrees with that, you know. Uh, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. Now think about that just for a second and compare that to Acts chapter 21 and ask yourself this question. Is he talking about the Jews here in Acts chapter 15, 24? Do we ever find a place in which James says they don't have to do the law of Moses to the Jews? No. You can't find it. See, James maintains a position in his mind that the Jews are still have to keep the law of Moses. Why do we believe that? Well, go to Acts 21. Look what he makes Paul do, right? That's why I'm saying that. So where does that come? Where does that go? To, where does that take us to today? That takes us to there are a group of people that are following that same mindset. It continues on throughout. It still goes. It still goes. It still goes to present modern day. And who are those people? We jokingly said last week, oh, it's the Roman Catholic Church. Well, Jokingly, but seriously, it is. It, it's, it's, that's, that's one grouping of them, but it's also the Lutherans, <clears throat> and it's also the Methodists. I mean, I, we, I had my mother-in-law in here one week. She's, she's only come like four or five times, and she came in one week, and of course, Russ had no uh, tact at all. <laughs> Kidding. He, he said something that was real good about the Methodists, and I'm like, well, you know what, but you know what, truth hurts, and it, it is what it is. So she said to me, she goes, well, how does he, how, who, who does he think he is? She says, as we're driving away, she says, who does he think he is to say that, you know, the Lutherans are wrong and the Methodists are wrong and the Dutes are wrong? I said, well, who's, I said to her, I said, well, if everybody's wrong, who's, is anybody right? And she goes, well, well what do you mean? I said, well, the Lutherans preach different things than the, the Methodists do and the Methodists preach contrary things than the Roman Catholics do and the Baptists preach different things than the Methodists do. So obviously they're all preaching from the same book or they're, they're saying they are. So cl clearly only one of them could be right, correct? And so she's like, well, 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 I mean, they, they are just doing, they're just doing their best, you know, some, some, some statement. And I said, okay, well, whatever it might be. She goes, well, I just, he said something about the Methodists that I just don't, I don't agree about. Now they grew up Methodist. Okay. I've been to there. I've been to several of the churches, the Methodist churches over the years that they've gone to at least 20 or 30 times over my lifetime. I've been to the Methodist church. It's wonderful. Oh, it's real, real bad, real boring. Uh, it's just, it's one of those things that it's, it's just like a, it's hilarious. I, I look at it and I'm like, this is this is what you consider to be church. There's no preaching at all, zero. The 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 whole thing is it's 
it's almost like we just want to make you feel good and then you're going to leave and get out of here and then you can just go on with your merry day and we're going to have a potluck and do you know that type of thing it's just it's just a little weird so anyways i said to her she goes well i don't believe that our church teaches that i've never heard our pastor preach that and of course i got way probably a little more testy than i should have and i said well how many discussions have you really had with your pastor one maybe two when you walked out the door and said thanks have a good day i mean have you ever sat down with him and spent more than you know two minutes no they haven't done that i mean my, my, well, I'm trying to get not get off t- sob subject, but it's important. I had a friend who said, "Oh, I saw I saw our pastor at Walmart the other day, and she she goes to one of the big mega church Baptist churches." And I said, "Well, did you talk to him?" She goes, "No." I'm like, "Have you ever talked to him?" She's like, "No." I'm like, she's telling me he, you don't even he doesn't even know who you are. She's like, "No." I'm like, "How's he your pastor in any way, shape, or form?" You know what I mean? That's that sounds ridiculous to me. I mean, you know how many hours I've spent with Russ? I mean, it, we probably shouldn't even talk about hours. We should probably talk about days. Maybe even not even just days. Probably should talk about weeks. That I've sat down and spent with him weeks, weeks, and Scott's a spouse product. I tell the same thing. We spent weeks with this guy, so you know I have a pretty close, intimate relationship with him, where where many people don't have that. But I think it's part of the reason why people don't have a lot of good doctrine. But she, so my mother-in-law, back to that story, she says, "Well, is anybody really right?" And I said, "You know, what? I don't think that's the issue. If anybody's really right, I think we have to talk about the issue of absolute truth." And kind of basically talked about that. And she says, "Well, I just don't believe." He said that the Methodists believe that you can lose your salvation. The Methodists believe that it's works and blah blah. blah. So. I said, well, they do. <clears throat> she goes, no, no, they, no, they don't. I've never heard my pastor say that. I said, okay, okay. Well, so she was really mad about the whole situation, and it's what it is. So I went home, and I went on to their website. The, the I'll just tell you, it's Oak Christian United Methodist. It doesn't really matter. I mean, who, what's, well, why are we trying to pander or play games? But Oak Christian United Methodist, and I went on their website, and they're part of the UMC, you know. And so I went on, and I pulled off from their website different of their catechism slash tenants and their things that they believe, and I highlighted the certain portions, and I sent it over to my mother-in-law. And the portions specifically state, you must keep the law. I mean, they, they say it They say it without saying it. You know, they say, like, it is necessary that a person abstain from evil. And if a person does too much evil, then the person isn't probably, isn't saved. And the person does not possess eternal life. And that nobody can really know until the end, blah, blah, blah. And all these weird things. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's really confusing. So they say one thing that the gospel is this, but then they say this other stuff. And that's the way the teaching goes. So I said, you know, they're not going to blank, you know, they're not going to, um, be blatant or obvious, they're going to be a little bit deceptive in how they say it. So I highlighted all the portions, and it was very particular. I mean, I, every piece, and I sent it over to her. I never heard back on that. Never heard back. But again, I'm, I'm trying, I, I feel like that's that's like an honest assessment of it, and nobody wants to be that way. Nobody wants to take that stuff. They're like, nah, that, me, me, me. You know, right? They're just like, they want to argue with you, or they want to get mad at you. And you're like, but I'm not, I just want to hand this to you and just put it on a piece of paper and this is what they say, so you need, you need to either look at it or not. Well, you know, with, with what's coming down from the pipes from Jerusalem, they're getting the absolute truth. They're getting it on the piece of paper that says, look, here it is. Here's our, here's our new scripture, as I've been preaching about. This is new scripture that they were getting. The, the Galatians, are, that, that whole book, you know, that was new scripture. And we read it today and we treat it as the scripture. We treat it as the word of God. We treat it as, you know, with the highest and utmost respect. And it's a great book to teach us the issues of legalism and what it's gonna what it's gonna bring and what it's gonna do. And is that book good just for the Jew, the Gentiles only? No. It's a book for Jews and it's a book for Gentiles. And today Jews and Gentiles can read it without distinction. So, you know, going on and finishing up in Acts chapter fifteen, it says, you know, hey, look, they, they were subverting your souls, verse twenty four, saying you must be circumcised to keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have sent therefore Judas, excuse me, and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you, notice you, who is that? The Gentiles, no greater, notice the word he uses, burden. Because <laughs> anytime you give anybody a law, it's a burden, right? Oh, I got to remember to keep it. I got to remember which one I got to do. I got to remember, should I do this one or shouldn't I do that one? So he says, to lay on you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornications, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. If you go to Acts 16, verse number 4, look what he says. It says, And as they went throughout the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep. See how that works? So these were commandments. I mean, they were decrees. They were commandments. That's what he said. These are the things you, you should not be doing. 
And he says, that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So this is stuff that, that every time they would go from place to place, they brought this with them. They said, this is the stuff. These are the decrees. These are the things. These are the big no-nos, right? We don't, we don't do this. We don't do that. We don't do these things, right? Now, what about murder? And what about debate and deceit and, and evil working and iniquity and, I mean, and, and adultery and lying and covetousness? And where are all those, right? What do you do next? How do you, how do you reconcile that? Well, if this is it, what's going to happen? People are going to abide by it only to the T, and then what are they going to do? Well, it's not to say it in there, so it means I can do anything I want to do, right? That's obviously not the truth, right? So Paul eventually just teaches, look, the rest of the law can be done in this nature, you know? Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, that's, that's the easiest way to say it. Now, that's a very cliche phrase, and people have turned that into something that it doesn't really mean. Uh, case in point the pro-choice thing, case in point, the latest gay debates and all those things. They say, love your neighbor as yourself. You need to love everybody. And I, I won't go there. Just, again, listen to the sermon that I have on let love be without dissimulation. It talks about that in detail. So anyways, after all of this, and they say, you know, lay up on these no greater things. You, he says, at the end of 29, of 6, 15, 29, ye shall do well, fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. When they had gathered them all together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they did what? They had rejoiced for consolation. They said, whoopee, yay, this is great. And then the question becomes, what did the Jews do? I'm sure the Jews are like, hold on, did uh, this apply to us too? Because Peter sure said that it applied to him because he's living as, the, as a Gentile, but then claims to be a Jew. And then when the Jews come over, he starts to go back and live like a Jew, only for as much time as is necessary to be a people pleaser, only as much time to save face so that they don't go back to James and figure anything out, right? When certain came from James, Peter withdrew himself and said, oh, better not go eat with the Gentiles anymore, right? So all that little nonsense, all of those things, you go, wow, this is, this is a really interesting sermon about Jews and Gentiles. Why do you make such a big distinction? I didn't write the Bible, okay? All this stuff is in here. It's all there. It's, I, most of Christianity probably hasn't even, heaven hasn't even looked at it, but it's important. And God put it in there for a purpose and to learn about the distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles is to better your understanding of the scripture to ultimately see so you can edify other people. And I've always said, and I'll, I'll close with this, it doesn't matter if people think it's good for them, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if people think it's good for them. Oh, this, this isn't necessary, or I don't need to do that. It is. Just like people take the gospel and they may say, well, I don't want the gospel. You're not responsible for the response of other people. You're not responsible for the acceptance of the message from other people. The only thing that you're responsible for is knowing the message and then talking to people about it. That's it. There's no persuasion that needs to happen. There's no beating people over the head. That's it. That's, that's your obligation. So it's very difficult oftentimes and it's very discouraging when you have you know, sure, would it be awesome to preach in front of 5,000 people? Yeah, probably be pretty cool to have 5,000 people listening to you. But at the same point in time, if you have 10 that are actually listening, and you have 5,000 that are there just to check off the box, I'll take the 10 who are actually listening any day of the week over the 5,000 who are there to check a box off to say, I finished my Sunday deal. Every time I go by Blessed Sacrament there, on uh, 66th, on uh, 113th and 66th, you know what I'm talking about back in there in Seminole? Saturday afternoons when I come home from fishing, it is jammed packed, jammed to the gills. Where I'm talking, people are parking in the ditches and they're attaining ditches and their cars are up like this and like that and it's all over the place and they're all doing it for the purpose of, you know, oh man, get out of there, gone, you know, that's it. They, they sing that doxology, whatever they do, and they're, they're out of there. And they, it is a, that parking lot was completely full. And if I did like a hyperlapse, it would be like five minutes. Like, the people are gone. They, they stay there only for as long as necessary to, to check it off the box because they do believe that by doing that, they are getting right with God. That, that is the way we get right with God. Well, we know that therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, all right, let's close in prayer.